chapter 6. Welcome to the public meeting for Arches Visitor Use Access and Experience Planning. My name is Patty Trapp and as the superintendent of Arches National Park, I thank you for joining us today. Arches National Park is a place unlike any other in the world and our high visitation numbers clearly illustrate its popularity. As many of you have experienced firsthand from 2009 to 2019, visitation to Arches grew over 66% and so has the resulting parking congestion and crowding. This has created public safety concerns as well as impacts to our legislative mission to provide quality, quality visitor experience and protect park resources for future generations. In 2019, we embarked on an updated visitor use management planning process and held our first public meeting. We took what you said and collected more information on potential solutions, including implementing a shuttle system and improving alternative park entrances. While several of these efforts are still ongoing, we're now ready to share what we have learned at this stage of the process. And that is where you come in. I truly believe that Arches is not separate from the community nor a visiting public, but a part of it. And as we enter this new stage in planning, we want to work collaboratively with you, our community members, our stakeholders and visitors to seek those solutions. More information on how to provide your input will be provided during this meeting today. And after today's presentation, I encourage you to visit the park's planning website to provide your comments. I appreciate your time and want to thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to hearing and learning from you. Hey folks and welcome again. Thanks Patty for welcoming us all to the meeting. My name is Rachel Collins. I'm a visitor use specialist with the National Park Service and I'll be one of the facilitators tonight. Before we get going into the meat of the presentation, I wanted to cover just a couple of logistics. We do have closed captioning for this meeting. So if that service is helpful for you, we're gonna post the link and the access code to that into the announcements or the chat feature for this meeting. So you can find those links there. Um, we'll also be collecting questions throughout this meeting. So if you have a question that you'd like us to try to answer, go ahead and use that Q&A feature that's a part of the meeting to drop your question in there. Like I said, we'll be collecting them throughout the presentation and then answering as many as we can at the end of the meeting. Like Patty said, this process is in early stages and we are so excited to invite you into this process to identify key issues and how we might take our next steps. So from now until October 5th, you're invited to participate in our planning effort by providing comments and feedback to assist us in those long-term ideas. This information that we gather is going to be super important for the next steps of the planning effort and the process. And that URL where you can provide comments is on your screen. I also wanted to provide a high level overview of what we're going to be covering in this presentation. We're going to start by doing a review of the issues and challenges that are bringing us to the table and that we're trying to resolve as a part of this process. We're also going to cover planning goals and our desired conditions, which help us to articulate what we're trying to achieve as we embark on this planning process. We're going to cover some lessons learned since we embarked on in data collection and other analyses since 2019 and then how that is fueling our next steps and your critical role in this process. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Angie to start walking us through the issues and challenges. Great, thanks Rachel and good evening everyone out there in our virtual land. Uh, my name is Angie Richmond and I'm the Chief of Interpretation, Education and Visitor Services for Arches and Canyonlands National Parks. And um, I've been here about three years now, but this is actually the second time that I have worked with this group of parks. Um, I was back here um, in 2003, 2004, and that was back when Arches still had its, um, its old entrance road. And it was before we had really expanded a lot of our, our parking lots in the park. And wow, was I surprised when I came back in 2018 
to see um, how much the park has expanded, um, you know, parking and the entrance road, and also just how much the community as a whole has grown and the visitation has increased. Um, before we get into and sharing an update on our planning efforts, we thought it would be important for me to kind of set the stage with the management issues that we are experiencing because of this increased visitation. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So as Patty mentioned earlier, visitation at Arches has increased 66% from 2009 to 2019. So the graph on the screen here beautifully illustrates that increase with the light green line at the bottom representing 2009 and the purple line at the top representing 2019. So we went from just under 1 million visitors in 2009 to roughly 1.7 million visitors in 2019. This upward trend has continued up to the present and we expect visitation to, to keep increasing for years to come. Uh, since 2019 or over the past two years, we have conducted several workshops, studies, we've collected data to really try to understand the underlying uh, issues that are occurring due to the rapid increase in visitation at Arches and we are looking for effective ways to address them. As an outcome of these efforts, we have identified a number of key management issues related to visitor use, visitor access, and visitor experience. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, you can see the Devil's Garden parking lot uh, completely full with cars starting to park on the inside of the loop on uh, the left side and on the right you can see a long line of cars waiting on the entrance road to get through the entrance station into arches it is now fairly common for visitors to wait in a long line to get into arches waits can last anywhere from 45 minutes up to an hour and for the unprepared visitor they can find themselves in these long lines without access to a restroom or be caught without water and snacks and we have seen people leave their cars and go searching for restrooms while they're waiting to get into the park. Um, additionally, if the line gets long enough, uh, it backs up onto Highway 191, and this causes a safety or a traffic hazard on uh, the highway for northbound travelers. And it's the responsibility of the park to mediate this hazard by surging enough cars into to the park to get the idling cars off of Highway 191. And we do this frequently throughout our busy season. These long lines make it difficult for our emergency response vehicles to enter the park and heavier use of park facilities like roads, trails, restrooms um, has required us to hire more staff and seek more funding just to maintain and upkeep our facilities here at Arches. Next slide. So increased visitation and overcrowding has required park staff to come up with a temporary solution when our parking lots become full. And currently, uh, how we do this is when our three main parking lots, Devil's Garden, Wolf Ranch, and the windows are 100% full, we implement a temporary closure of the main park gate. And that's what you can see in the upper image. Um, so, as, so we don't allow more cars into the park until enough cars have left. Um, from April to the end of June this past summer, we had to delay entry 120 times. Um, in 2021, so this, this past year, we have had to implement this practice more than any other year before. So the graph on this slide shows the entrance delays from April to June. Each gr green line illustrates the day and the duration that the park had a delayed entry. On a few occasions, we had to do this twice in a day. So for example, if you look at um, Memorial Day, so 529 and 530, um, you can see a second green line um, up above in the afternoon hours. And those are the days when we, we had to do a, a second temporary closure. Um, as visitors and locals became more aware of these entrance delays um, because they were happening uh, so frequently, many visitors started arriving earlier and earlier in the day and it, as a result, it moved our the timing of these entry delays earlier in the day as well. And so if you follow the, the graph from left to right, you can see it kind of steadily moving down or earlier in the day. And some delays this past summer uh, happened as early as, as 8 a.m. 
These uh, entrance delays cause a lot of uncertainty for employees trying to get to work and for visitors when trying to enter the park. Uh, visitors can become very frustrated as they look um, for a plan B while waiting to come back in the afternoon later you know, to enter arches. Um, obviously, this is not the experience that we want our visitors to go away with. Next slide, please. Other issues we are seeing in the park are shown here. The image on the left shows a full parking lot with visitors circling looking for a parking spot. Uh, visitors can get confrontational with each other over parking spots and they are spending more time in their cars and less time out in the resource. And the image on the right shows a very crowded, delicate arch. Many visitors are seeking a less crowded experience at the iconic locations in the park, and those experiences are becoming increasingly rare. And visitors are now letting us know they think the park is too crowded and they would like to see the park take steps to improve their experience. Next slide. When parking lots fill, visitors get really creative on how to find a place to park along the roadway. Some will park uh, sticking out into traffic, causing a safety issue for other cars traveling on the road. Some will park on top of sensitive resources along the roadway, causing significant damage to plants, wildlife, and other living things the park is here to protect. And for instance, the plants along the roadway are often the plants that are in the best condition because they get the rain water or the runoff from the roadway. So when they are damaged, it's a huge impact to these fragile desert, desert resources. And then lastly, on this slide, you can see uh, in the image on the right is a social trail. And as visitors park along the roadway, they will either walk down the main road to get to where they're going, causing a huge safety concern, or they will create new social trails damaging soils and soil crust in the park. And once started, these social trails are very difficult to remove and, and restore. Ah, next slide. With the various parking and roadway concerns that I have mentioned and the overcrowding, the park has hired a team of visitor service assistants to work in our parking lots to help visitors park, um, to help them be prepared for their time in the resource, and to notify employees at the entrance when parking lots are full. In these three images, you can see our VSA employees hard at work helping visitors park in the right places. Um, these employees are critical to facilitating our entrance delays and will notify staff at the gate when it is time to enact an, enact an entrance delay or time um, when enough cars have left the parking lots that we can allow uh, visitors to enter the park again. Um, so that's a huge benefit to have these employees. However, the downside is with these additional employees, we have diverted funding um, to pay for this program, which puts a strain on other operations. And we also need additional housing for additional employees. And this is a challenge here in Moab, as you all know. Um, it's not unique to the park service. It's something that we all struggle with. Um, so, you know, couple that with the high cost of living and the lack of housing, it's really hard for us to bring in new employees and to keep them here. Next slide, please. So many of the issues I mentioned directly relate to the reasons why Arches was set aside for protection in the national park system. Arches balances both the preservation of extraordinary geologic features and landscapes, as well as the ability to provide a quality visitor experience for everyone who visits. When we embark on planning and decision-making processes, the Park Service uses the park's purpose and significance to inform the vision and goals of the process. So the park purpose for Arches is listed on the slide here and was pulled from our foundation document, which we will be linking to in the chat box. Um, and I will now turn it over to Amy to talk more about our planning process. Thanks, Angie. Hello, and thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Amy Tendick, and I'm the park planner for Arches National Park. Next slide, please. When we start into planning and decision-making processes, we need to start by addressing the question, what are we managing for? The answer to that question helps drive our vision and goals for the future and frames our objectives. At Arches, our goals for long-term planning 
revolve around resolving the issues of trail and destination crowding and parking lot congestion so that we can provide for a variety of high quality visitor experiences while also protecting resources. These goals are common to all areas of the park and are the overall drivers of our process. Next slide, please. One of our goals for this planning process <clears throat> is to develop a comprehensive strategy for how to address these goals. I mean, these issues, sorry. To do this, we are using the visitor use management framework from the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council. The VUM framework is shared by all six federal land and water management agencies and is the framework the Park Service uses for guiding us through visitor use management decisions. To learn more about the Council and the framework, follow the link in the chat. To accomplish these goals, we establish desired conditions that paint a picture of how an area will look, feel, sound, and function in the future. To answer the question of what we are managing for, we refer to these desired conditions to ensure that we are achieving and maintaining these values. In developing desired conditions, we consider full systems and how experiential and resource attributes are integrated. Desired conditions align with the purpose or reason the area was established. They highlight those things that are valued and or unique for that area, including the park purpose or fundamental resources and values that Angie mentioned. They provide the clarity and specificity that direct management actions hope to achieve. For this planning process, these desired conditions are organized by different areas of the park known as zones. We use zoning to account for the fact that meeting these goals might look and sound different in different areas of the park. Next, we're gonna go over the desired conditions of different zones at a high level, but we encourage you to refer to the desired conditions section of the story map to understand desired conditions of specific zones. The story map can be found on the park planning website during this public comment period. Desired conditions are also an opportunity for us to reflect on shared values. So we look forward to your feedback on what you value about your experience, experiences in these different locations in the park. Next slide, please. This slide shows all of the zones within Arches. The expansive tan area covering the vast majority of the, of the park is zoned as backcountry. This zone coincides with areas of the park managed as wilderness. The backcountry zone includes lightly used areas of the park where visitors can hike cross country along washes or on primitive trails or marked routes. Through untrailed canyons and over slick rock, visitors will have the opportunity to experience challenge and adventure and connection to the natural environment and human history. Visitors will be able to explore a landscape with minimal impacts or evidence of other people and experience solitude and natural soundscapes consistent with the qualities of wilderness that we are managing for. As you look at this map, think about what makes your experience, experiences in the Arches backcountry unique. What attributes of the Arches backcountry are important to protect now and into the future? The sensitive resource protection zone is highlighted in orange and this, is, this area provides visitors the opportunity to experience protected view sheds and minimal modern human influences within critical view sheds and sensitive areas. How does resource protection contribute to the value and quality of your arches experiences? Next slide, please. There are three motorized zones within the park. All motorized zones include roads with varying levels of development, both of the roads themselves and of areas along the roads. The motorized sightseeing zone is highlighted in black, and this is a substantially developed zone with paved roads, pullouts, parking areas with short trailed and picnic opportunities. The semi-primitive motorized zone highlighted in brown includes the maintained unpaved Salt Valley Road and the spur to the Tower Arch Trailhead. The primitive motorized zone highlighted in pink consists of the four-wheel drive roads in the park. All motorized zones foster a connection to the resources of the park, but offer differing types of visitor experiences. Visitors in the motorized sightseeing zone are more likely to encounter other visitors and staff in these areas, where the semi-primitive and primitive zones offer a sense of remoteness. 
The four wheel drive road corridors provide for a slower and more technical driving experience and opportunities to view and access remote areas of the park. As you view these three motorized zones, we want to know what you value about your driving experiences and arches. How might each of these areas uniquely contribute to your arches experience? What does each of these areas provide that you wouldn't find in other areas of the park? Next slide, please. The developed zone, highlighted in red, includes much of the park's facilities, including the visitor center, headquarters and administrative areas, campground and picnic areas. The pedestrian zone, highlighted in blue, consists of the developed trails that access prime park features, including landscape arch, delicate arch, and the windows. The hiker zone, highlighted in purple, includes trails of a more primitive nature than the pedestrian zone and those that require more of a time commitment from visitors. This includes the Devil's Garden Primitive Loop, the Park Avenue and Tower Arch Trails, among others. These three zones have varying levels of development to serve different purposes and tend to be higher use than other areas of the park. Visitors have opportunities to learn about and experience the resource in a range of ways, including in areas close to facilities and services, on well-defined trails that are highly developed, or to and through areas that remain more primitive in nature. In all of these zones, visitors are likely to encounter other groups of visitors. In the hiker zone, there are more opportunities for solitary experiences. We want to understand from you what you seek for your experiences in these areas of the park. We invite you to use Pepsi to share with us what you value about recreational opportunities at Arches. What words, themes, or ideas would you use to describe a high quality hiking experience at Arches? Now I'm going to hand it back to Rachel to discuss some of what we've learned over the last several years of additional data collection and analysis. Great, thanks Amy. So the National Park Service has been engaged in several data collection efforts since 2019 to help us better understand congestion in the park and how this relates to visitor experiences. The focus of these investigations is to answer the questions that are on the screen. We really wanted to dig into these topics and better understand what could we learn about visitor travel? What are the patterns associated with visitor use? And how might there be other ways? What other ways could we be access? Could visitors be accessing Arches National Park? Uh, on the next few slides, we're going to start to unpack what we're learning related to each of these questions and from our ongoing studies. Firstly, we wanted to learn more about who Arches visitors are and where they go in the park. Ongoing data collections are helping the Park Service to document attributes of visitor travel. These collections allow us to quantify and better describe the levels of use that you may have experienced during visits to Arches in recent years. We have learned over time that vehicle arrivals are the highest on weekend days and holidays, particularly on Saturdays. The average vehicle entries for June of 2020 are shown on the graph on the right side of the slide. You can see in this graph that arrivals begin as early as four in the morning, peak somewhere between 8 and 10 o'clock in the morning and then taper off throughout the rest of the day. During this peak, an average of 225 vehicles per hour are arriving in that time period. On Sundays, this number can be as high as 350 vehicles per hour arriving at the park. Relatedly, these high demand time periods can result in queues that are between 20 minutes to over an hour in length. As a comparison, queues in the afternoon are closer to five to 10 minutes on average. We've also learned that visitors spend about a half a day in the park or on average three and a half hours. Once visitors are inside the park, we wanted to learn more about how visitors move around the park and how they access different areas. These studies showed us that most, the most popular areas within Arches National Park are the windows, Delicate Arch and Devil's Garden. It's very rare that visitors don't include one of these sites on their visit to the park, and just over one third of visitors go to all three. We're also learning more about the meaningful and important relationships between the number of visitors who arrive in the park, the number of visitors who are trying to access key recreational resources and parking areas, 
and what that means for the number of visitors at those key destinations and those iconic viewpoints. These preliminary results point to the potential for us to move from theoretical models to practical tests through pilot, pilot testing of potential solutions. We also wanted to further investigate both the feasibility and viability of other ways that visitors could access arches in the future. One idea we're evaluating is whether creating a secondary entrance road using either Salt Valley Road or Willow Springs Road could help us to address issues and achieve desired conditions. More specifically, could it alleviate congestion at the park entrance station and at primary attraction sites? This analysis revealed that it would take a substantial fund, a substantial amount of funding to improve either of these roadways so that they could support paving. And while paving these roads could provide another entry option for those vehicles from the north and the west of the park, they wouldn't reduce congestion within the park or the competition for parking at the popular destinations. Also, as Amy discussed earlier, the challenging nature of these roadways would be a change or to change the nature of these roadways would be a change to the unique recreational value that these roadways provide. Having this opportunity for a sense of remoteness, adventure, challenge, and self-sufficiency is an important component of the Arches experience. While this is an attribute that's not easy to quantify, it's no less important in our analysis of the relative benefits and trade-offs of any future set of solutions we might consider. Additionally, we're actively evaluating two shuttle options. Over time, we found that shuttles can be considered to help visitors access the Arches National Park without relying exclusively on personal vehicles. These systems are best suited when they are financially feasible and help the park to achieve resource protection and visitor experience goals. First, we've considered what a mandatory shuttle operation would look like. On the screen are the two scenarios that we've been analyzing and could be used for a mandatory shuttle. This mandatory shuttle could provide access to all primary park sites, and this would eliminate parking congestion at those primary sites and vehicle congestion at the entrance station. In the one shuttle route scenario, which is the map in the middle, uh, during peak periods, there would be long wait times of up to 70 minutes to board the bus at the visitor center and ride times from the visitor center to Delicate Arch would be at least 50 minutes. For comparison, it takes about 25 minutes to drive this route with a private vehicle. In the two shuttle route scenario, the visitor center boarding wait times are decreased to 13 minutes and the ride time to Delicate Arch is about 46 minutes. A shuttle bus system like this would require a large park and ride outside of the park and or a connection to transit service in Moab. Many of the findings for a mandatory shuttle are applicable to a voluntary shuttle system as well. However, congestion under a voluntary shuttle system would only be reduced if roughly a quarter of visitors opted to use the shuttle instead of their private vehicle access, and then private vehicle access didn't increase past those levels. Few NPS units with voluntary shuttles have attained this level of voluntary ridership. These shuttle systems would require a significant capital investment as well as operating expenses and will require the park to make investment trade-offs in order to support a shuttle system. So user fees or other funding sources would need to be considered to support implementation of this type of strategy. To continue to grow our collective understanding of potential management strategies, the park is proposing to pilot a timed entry reservation system. For the duration of this temporary pilot, visitors would need a reservation to enter the park during certain times of day. Visitors would be able to book these reservations in advance through recreation.gov after the new year. The graph you're seeing on the screen shows vehicle entries into arches by hour. Each of those blue lines is a unique day in July of 2020. The gray line represents an estimate of how many vehicles could enter the park per hour to maintain sustainable traffic flows and experiential conditions across the park. The spring pilot will use this timed entry reservation to manage access to the park consistent with our desired conditions. The studies so far indicate that a timed entry system could proactively pace visitation into the park, 
and provide visitors with a predictable arrival time, all while protecting resources and providing a less crowded visitor experience. This pilot is critical to helping park managers better understand how we could use a system like this to better achieve our desired conditions and management goals, and also provide an opportunity for you to experience a system like this and provide us feedback. So with that, I am going to turn the mic over to Kate, welcome her on to the screen, to share with you all some of our next steps that are coming up and your critical role in this process. All right, hello everyone. My name is Kate Thomas and I am the Public Affairs Specialist for Arches National Park. It's really great to be with you all today. So where do we go from here? Following the data collection that we've been conducting over the past two years, we have a couple of immediate next steps in our process. First, we are going to spend this fall and winter finalizing data analysis, and we also use the comments that we receive to help inform how we frame the next steps in our planning process. In the spring and summer of 2022, we are planning to implement a temporary timed entry reservation system. This pilot will help clarify how a timed entry program could contribute to a larger management plan to address visitor use, access, and experience at Arches. We will use data gathered from the pilot to help us answer questions about the impacts, feasibility, and sustainability of such a program. Next slide. As Amy noted earlier in the presentation, we are using the Interagency Visitor Use Management Planning Framework for this project. At the public meeting in fall of 2019, we kicked off step one, building the foundation. Since that time, we've moved on to step two, defining visitor use management directions for the park. We are currently at this stage. And during this stage, the park has been working on determining desired conditions and considering potential strategies for going forward. We are now encouraging you to be active participants in this process. Your perspective on what makes a high quality visit to Arches is a critical component of helping us craft a thoughtful visitor use management direction for the park. After we gather your comments and collect data from the timed entry pilot, we will transition into step three, identifying management strategies. Then we will propose potential strategies, actions, and other ideas we might pursue to help us meet our desired conditions. After we develop potential strategies, we will again ask for public comment at this stage. Our goal will be to hear your ideas and learn how we can include those ideas in our planning process. Finally, at step four, we will put together a draft plan that includes all components of the project framework. The park will then put out the draft for public comment. So this means that we will have at least two more public comment periods before we finalize our plan. Next slide. So now we're going to discuss your critical role. Next slide. During this comment period, we want you to dig into the specific questions that you see on this slide. We'd like you to ask yourself the following. What do you value most about Arches National Park? What issues interfere most with your desired park experience at Arches? What strategies or combination of strategies do you think best achieve this and why? You don't need to write down all of these questions because they will be visible on the story map which we will link again for you in just a moment. You will have an opportunity to respond to each question on the story map by following a link to the public comment page. We truly appreciate your perspective on the issues facing Arches and believe that you have potential solutions that will contribute in a meaningful way to our process. We want to understand what you value most about the park and what experiences you find the most important. Next slide. So, how can you comment? You have an active voice in the process, and between September 6th and October 5th, you can type up and submit your comments at the URL listed on the screen. We also encourage you to access the story map as a reference when submitting your comments. Using the comments you provide, we can work together to overcome challenges, ensure positive visitor experiences, and protect the park for future generations. 
All right, so we want to thank you for your time today. We've been collecting questions as we've been going through this presentation, and it looks like we haven't received too many right now. So if you have additional questions, feel free to use the Q&A box to drop them in right now. And we will do our best to answer all the questions and we'll see how much time we have to answer everything. Um, looks like we should have enough time so far, but you know, please go ahead, put your questions in the box and we are going to take a uh, quick, quick break. And um, we probably, we, we were planning to do two minutes, but let's do five just to make sure that you have time to type up any questions that you might have so that we can come back and answer those. So, all right, great, thanks.
All right, everybody. We gave you a couple extra minutes there, but we'll go ahead and get started on answering some of these questions. So the first question that I have pulled up is about a, uh, a shuttle system. So the question that I see here is, would Arches National Park ever consider mimicking Zion's shuttle system? And I will give that over to Rachel. So Rachel, could you answer that one? Yeah, Kate, I'd love to answer that one. Um, so Zion system is similar to the mandatory shuttle system um, that we analyzed. And I'm going to check my notes because I want to get the mileages right to make sure that I um, get this correct. The total round trip distance for Zion system is 16 miles and the Arches round trip distance would be 54 miles. And the reason I wanted to get that right is because I think it's an important distinction when we start to think about the frequency that shuttles could arrive, the ride time between different sites, and how that plays into system design. So we could and we are actively looking at a mandatory shuttle system, but those are some of the critical differences between how that system would show up in the Arches context versus how it shows up in the Zion, in the Zion context. Uh, hang on just a second. I'm not seeing the next question highlighted quite yet. I'm going to refresh the questions. Just give me a moment. And I'm still not seeing them, but I, I have a list of questions over here. So um, another one that we received was Utah's Mighty Five advertising campaign was a major factor in the growth and visitation. Are you doing anything to work with them to moderate the influence of Utah's advertising campaigns? And I think we have Angie who will answer this one. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, so yeah, partnerships are critical to um, the success of our planning efforts, and we have worked quite a bit with the Utah Office of Tourism, who and they were the folks that put on the Utah um, Mighty Five campaign, and they do have a local office here in Moab, and up until just a couple weeks ago, Elaine Gisler was the, the director here in Moab, and we worked quite a bit with her on um, her recent campaign that she launched on Recreate Responsibly, and the whole idea behind that was that we would better inform visitors before they came to Moab and the Moab area so that they would be you know, just better prepared to recreate on our on our lands here. And I do believe that that has been a huge success, um, but it's still an ongoing process. And, you know, we'll, we'll need to reach out to the uh, the new person who replaces Elaine. And then we still do work with the folks up in the, the Salt Lake office and provide them a lot of feedback on a lot of the things I talked about, about the issues that we're experiencing here at Arches and kind of where we're headed with with some of our uh, our planning efforts. Good question and thanks Kate, back to you. Okay, great. So we are getting a lot of questions on the pilot itself. So um, I think one of the questions that we have right here is um, would people living locally have access to the park without using timed entry? And we have Amy listed to answer this one. So Amy, can you go ahead and answer that? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, we did hear this uh, previously um, in this process, and I know that there are a lot of people here locally 
who uh, love visiting arches and, and come to the park frequently. And we want to be able to accommodate um, all visitors, including the local visitors to the park um, through through any management action we implement. Um, you know, providing different allocations for visitors under a timed uh, entry permit system based on locality is challenging, however, as there's always going to be a community just on the edge of a boundary, making it impossible to determine a fair and equitable way to define local. Um, it's important that fees for parks are collected fairly and equitably. And for these reasons, the Park Service believes that the best way to provide fair and equitable access to parks is to provide all potential visitors with the same opportunities for access. Thank you for the question. All right, Amy, and I'm going to put you on the spot for a few more questions related to the pilot. So folks are looking for some details about the pilot. So do we have any details about the timed entry plan, like the cost for reservations um, or if busy times or not as busy times, if they are available for a general entry, how how will that work? All right, thank you for the question again. Um, so at this time, we do not have um, a lot of details on the pilot itself. We're still in the er early stages of developing the timed entry pilot. Um, so we we would um, we're considering starting the pilot in April of 2022. Um, but as far as how how long the pilot would run, um, hours of the day and allocations that that's that is still being determined. Um, but we will be in uh, communication with the public as those details get figured out here um, in the next uh, throughout the fall and winter. And um, we'll make sure to incorporate feedback that we hear during this public comment period in, into the pilot design as much as possible and also um, consider feedback as we as we run the pilot. Thank you. All right, great, thanks so much. Okay, so the next question that I have is, would Arches ever consider a hiking permit system for Delicate Arch? And Rachel, could you answer that one for us? Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting idea and definitely an idea that we see come up in other places. I think we absolutely could consider um, what a site-specific permit would look like. One of the things that we want to really think about as we consider those types of ideas is how does that help us uh, meet our desired conditions? How does that help us resolve issues? What are the trade-offs going to be associated with a strategy like that? And what might the trade-offs be in that location and in other locations? So I actually would love to hear more from the person who provided this question or other folks who have thoughts on it of, what does a site-specific permit mean to you? How does it help improve your visitor experience of arches? And what do you think the potential trade-offs might be of that that might distract from your visitor experience? I think that that's one of the really important parts of a comment period like this. And one of the really interesting ways that we learn more about these types of strategies is by hearing from you um, and about how those strategies really support that experience that you're trying to achieve. Thanks, Kate. All right, thanks. And I have another question for you, Rachel. So what has Arches been able to learn from the experiences of other national parks that implemented a reservation system this year? So specifically, uh, what were the effects on visitation and local economies? So this uh, person asked, or, or they understand, that Yosemite, Rocky Mountain, Acadia, and Glacier implemented reservation systems for the first time this year. So they are looking to learn more about what the economic impacts were um, and then also what the, the effects on visitation were. Yeah, sure. So we as an agency are actively collaborating on all of these and constantly sharing lessons learned. That's one uh, real, the really wonderful benefits about being a part of the larger Park Service family is being able to learn from each other and with each other. I think one of the things as we think about these timed entry or reservation systems um, or other reservation systems, managed access systems that we have service-wide, each one is really thoughtfully and intentionally designed 
for the place that it's being implemented. And so Yosemite system is not the same system design as Acadia system is not the same as Rocky Mountain system. And so, because we know that each of those contexts is meaningful, each community is meaningful, each user group is meaningful, and each park is a unique con contributor to those areas and has a unique visitor experience associated with it. And so what we really are trying to do is take our best from the studies that we've done our best um, from what we've learned service-wide, and then really bring that into collaboration with what we're hearing from you about what does this pilot system look like for you? How might this strategy in this context provide for an enhanced visitor experience for you? What are those potential trade-offs? And we really wanna take into consider all three of those as we consider system design for Arches specifically. Thanks, Kate, it's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> I think that was a good, a good answer. Um, and then the next question that I see here is, and, and this might be a difficult one to answer, Rachel, but based on data from other parks, do visitors prefer timed entry or do they prefer shuttles? Do we do we have any information about that? I don't know of any data source that would tell us one way or the other on that in a concrete percentages kind of way. I think one of the things we've observed over time is that um, as people learn about reservation systems and have an experience with them, it changes their perspective on how they work and what they do and gaining that experience. And we're also in a situation right now where we're all learning a lot about how we access different public spaces. Um, and that's kind of shifted globally. Uh, as we've looked at some of those things. I think that we really want to be thinking about how we actively protect and enhance a range of types of access experiences for folks um, to meet people where they're at and those uh, different types of desired park experiences, especially when it comes to how people access their parks. Great, thank you. So the next question I have is for Angie, and it's about annual pass holders. So uh, one of the questions that we received was, how about an annual pass hour uh, schedule? So for example, between 8 to 10 a.m. or so, you could have the park open just for annual pass holders. And, and that's what we're kind of interpreting, or at least assuming that this question is asking. And if that's not what you're asking, please drop that in the chat box and, and let us know. But uh, Angie, how, how about annual pass holder hours? How how would that work or would that work? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, that's that's not really something that we are considering, um, you know, because it does provide preferential treatment um, for pass holders and it may exclude visitors who aren't able to afford the annual pass. Um, so we as we implement strategies, we will constantly, you know, consider strategies that are equitable to everyone. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right, let's see here. I'm waiting for my next question to load. Let's see. OK, there we go. So as far as the shuttle service idea goes, is it possible to offer incentives to use the shuttle service? And uh, this person says that they feel like that might encourage more people to use a shuttle if there are incentives. So Rachel, can you answer that one? I can answer this question with another question is I actually would love to see in our correspondence what would incentivize people to ride a shuttle? Um, I think that incentives we know as a construct can be very motivating. 
Um, I think that we also really think intentionally about the differences of people when they're traveling on vacation are not this don't make the same types of decisions as people when they're traveling in their day to day world. Right. So a recreational traveler is a different than a different than a commuter traveler. And what might incentivize someone to use a shuttle service or a bus um, in a urban environment um, or during a commuting type of situation is going to be different than what incentivizes a person to ride a shuttle when they're on vacation or in a recreational travel kind of frame. So I actually am super curious to see uh, what folks have to say, what they think about what would be incentivizing to them to participate in that um, type of a system. So what are the operating conditions? What are the timings? What are the other incentives or system design components that would make that system something that incentivizes you to ride it and to participate in it? That would really help us out. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, you are welcome. And Rachel, I actually have a similar question for you. So is there any data on how long people will generally wait before entry, before they just decide that it's not worth it to wait anymore? Do you know? I have not seen a study on how long people will wait. Um, I also think that that would be something that could be fairly context specific um, and probably would be pretty variable because we just know that we have a lot of different types of visitors that are coming uh, with a lot of different types of things that they're trying to achieve, uh, different um, groups that are in their family that might motivate how long they would wait for a shuttle or wait in line for a thing um, and what the conditions are of that day. So I would I would think that it's probably highly variable, but I haven't seen a study to that effect. It's a really interesting research question. Great, thanks, Rachel. And I'm just checking my list here. Not seeing the next one yet. So sorry, sorry about that. I know that that's probably a little inconvenient waiting for us to load these questions, but we appreciate your patience with this. Looks like we got two new questions. All right, so I think uh, the next question that we'll go for is about carrying capacity. So one of those questions is, what do you consider the carrying capacity of the park to be? How many visitors and cars are you trying to accommodate? So I will toss that over to Rachel again. Yeah, so this is a great question uh, when we start to think about, you know, what is the visitor capacity of the park and how do we get to that? So we really wanted to dig into spending some time to think about and share and get some information with desired conditions, because ultimately it comes back to that question of how do we um, 
protect and maintain and even enhance those desired conditions of the park. And so the definition in the park service that we use for visitor capacity is the maximum allowable use that a park can sustain while achieving and maintaining those desired conditions. And so that's part of the active process that we're in is to articulate those desired conditions and then to start to think about, so what does that mean for identifying a capacity? And then what strategies might we need to manage to that capacity in service to uh, achieving and maintaining those desired conditions? So if folks want to learn more about the process that we use to identify visitor capacities and the strategies to manage them, there's actually a whole guidebook on this on the Interagency Visitor Use Management Council's website. And I think we provided that link in the chat a little bit ago. Um, or you can just go to visitorusemanagement.nps.gov and you can find the guidebook for how we identify capacities there. And that's the process we'll be using. All right, great, thank you. Um, so this next question I think will also be for Rachel. So why not make Salt Valley or Willow Springs new entrance roads? So I think we covered this a little bit um, on one of the slides and said that there is the potential to kind of change the nature of those roads um, from the way they're set up um, as kind of recreational vehicle roads where there's a little bit more solitude. It's just a different kind of driving experience to applying pavement to them to have them uh, be more like the primary entrance road. Um, and so we're actively looking into the potential of that idea. Um, again, there's a pretty substantial cost associated with doing that. And then we also want to think about the experiential trade-offs associated with an idea like that. And what would that mean for changing the nature of those roads? And what's the trade-off in recreational experiences to change the nature of those roadways since they are currently used for um, by a user group as a recreational experience at the park? So we want to kind of take the whole the whole picture of, of what is that, what are the benefits and trade-offs and associated financial costs of that strategy into consideration. So we're actively looking at it. All right, great. And then the next question is also for you, Rachel. So uh, somebody wrote, is there any fear that a timed entry system would segue into a lottery like has happened with the wave? So would we move from a timed entry system to perhaps a lottery? Is there any possibility of that? Very interesting. This is a great group of people who are asking really like meaty questions, which is super fun for us. Uh, okay, so uh, the, one of the reasons I really like this question is because it gives us an opportunity to ask another prompting question, which is one of my favorite things to do. Um, because how, whether the lottery system really has to do how permits are sold um, and whether you go into a lottery system and you kind of put in for your days and then we put them all together and then do a lottery to see um, who, how those permits go versus a first come first serve sales. Um, of passes. And I, the reason that I think that this is a really interesting thing to explore and would love to see feedback on this in the correspondence is because it goes back to how do you plan your trip and what resources do you need to plan your trip to Arches National Park? And when do you do that trip planning? Because I think all of those inputs really help us think critically over the next couple of months about the design of the pilot system to think about how could we provide this um, those permits in a way um, that is consistent with how people want to be planning their trip and the timeline that aligns with their other trip planning. We know people do all kinds of trip planning activities like getting rental cars and potentially getting hotel reservations. And so we really want to align the system with those other systems. So I'd love to learn more from folks about how they're planning their trip, what resources they're using to planning their trip, when they're planning their trip so that we can do our best to align with those other systems as you plan your trip and have this be another trip planning component. All right, great. And one more question for you, Rachel, before we move over to Angie. Uh, how do we know it's crowded? 
What what have we studied to come to that conclusion? Well, I think one of the things, and Angie touched on this so well at the beginning of the presentation, was that we have seen over time increased uh, vehicles coming to the park, and that results in entrance queuing. Uh, where we're seeing increased um, people who are trying to access these phenomenal recreational resources, which means the probability or the likelihood that you're going to be able to find parking at your destination, your preferred destination is decreasing over time. And all of that results in more people at these destinations. And so I think that that's another really intriguing question. Would love to hear more from folks about what does crowded mean to you? Um, what is your desired Arches experience? And what are those conditions, experiences, um, observations that you've had that interfere with your desired condition um, or your desired experience at the park. I think that that is a really important point, a really important voice and a contribution that you make to our process to really help us answer that question. Um, what does that mean for Arches? What does crowded mean for Arches? And more importantly, what does that mean for your experience of Arches? And how does that interplay with your desired condition and your desired experience at the park? Great, that was that was really good. So these next questions will be for Angie. And uh, some folks would like to know what we are in the meantime doing to protect the park. So uh, what is being done right now currently to eliminate social trails and protect things like cryptobiotic soil? What actions are we currently taking to protect those things? Great, thanks, Kate. Um, so we, you know, part of our VSA program and then also with our interpretive staff, we have a lot more people out on trails. And part of that is um, is due to our COVID mitigations and how we've shifted some of our programming. We we're actually able to um, get more people out in the park. And so we're doing a lot more um, interaction with visitors before. They head out on trails. Um, you know, our VSAs are trying to catch them before they park out of bounds and really help them park. Um, and then we do for like the the cryptobiotic soil, we do have small signs um, that we're able to install um, right at the beginning of social trails to let people know that uh, not to go there, that that's a you know out of bounds area, and then try to to block it off in a way to um, to allow us to later restore that area. So we're, we're trying to get out there on the ground more, talk to visitors uh, face to face more. And um, and then in some cases we have had have added additional signage. So um, did I capture everything that that question asked? <laughs> yes, I, okay. I think it did. looks good. All right. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, you are welcome. OK, so right now we don't have any other questions, so I'm just going to do one last call for questions. If you have anything else you'd like to submit, please do so at this time. We'll give you about another minute um, and uh, we'll just take a look at the Q&A box. And if we don't get anything, then we will conclude the meeting.
All right, well, it looks like we're not getting any other questions, so we'll go ahead and wrap things up. As a reminder, in order for your comments to be considered, they do need to be submitted at the Pepsi, that's the planning website that was linked earlier in the chat. So definitely, if you have something to say, submit it there so that it can be officially counted. And uh, check out that story map too. It's very useful. It has a lot of great images, graphs, and information on what we've learned so far and where we're going. So definitely take a look at those resources and provide us those comments. We're really looking forward to it. The comment period ends on October 5th, so you have a little less than a month to submit those comments, but we are really grateful for your time. We're so happy that you joined us tonight, and I think that'll do it. So again, with your help, we are confident that we can work together to overcome challenges, uh, ensure that we have positive visitor experiences in the future, and protect Arches National Park for this and future generations. So thank you all very much, and have a great night.